Hi everyone and welcome to the Be Ready for the World Conference. I'm Emma from Cambridge University Press and I'm going to be hosting today's webinar. I'm delighted to be joined by Nick Peachy. Nick has over 20 years experience working with online and blended learning and he's going to be sharing this expertise with you over the next 45 minutes. Before we start, I just wanted to go through a few quick points with you. You may have noticed your microphones are muted. They're going to stay on mute for the whole of the session. And this is just so that we get no background noise. Nick and I are also hosting this webinar um, from our houses. So if there are any issues with the internet connections, please do bear with us. We'll get back up and running as soon as we can. There is going to be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So do post any questions you'd like um, in the Q&A box as we go through. You can also use the chat box function for any general questions, but please don't post questions for Nick in here as we can get them lost in the chat with so many people joining today. If you do have any technical difficulties throughout with sound or video, do shout in the chat and we'll do our best to help you resolve them. Um, and I would ask also that you please don't share any of your personal details in the chat because we do have a large number of people joining. We recommend you use headphones to listen to the session because you'll get the best sound quality and we are recording the webinar and we'll be sending a link to the playlist following the conference, so please don't worry if you miss anything. If you can't see the Q&A or chat icons, if you hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen, they should appear for you. Um, again, please do let us know in the chat if you're having problems with that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Nick now. Nick, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone, and uh, good to see so many people here. So this session, as you probably know, if you can see the screen, is on engaging students and building rapport in the remote classroom. And it's, it's something that's been a kind of obsession for me for quite a few years, actually, as I've been involved in online, online teaching and delivering uh, remote classes like this one for quite some time. Anyway, I'll just give you a a little bit of inf information about my background. Um, I'm, my name's Nick Peachy. Um, I'm director of Peachy Publications, where, where I publish my own materials. I'm also an online course designer and won the uh, British Council Innovations Award in 2012 for um, designing a blended learning course. Um, I also, I'm also a content author and won the um, Innovations Award in 2016 for a book I developed called Digital Video. And you know, my fourth role at the end there is that I will also work in as a technology consultant and trainer. As you can see, these, these the photographs in the images were were taken before lockdown, and I didn't have the beard back then, but. Um, they're still that's still me, honestly. Um, if if uh, during the presentation, um, I'll be uh, I'll be sharing a number of slides with you, a number of links, and I will also share the um, presentation a link to the presentation with you. So if you want a copy of the presentation, you will get that at the end. And if you want to sort of go in in more depth into some of these things, you know, by all means do. There's links across the bottom here to my social media connections where I share some of the things that I do, which are related to online and remote teaching. So that's good. And yes, there will be a recording available. So you'll get the presentation, recording, and don't worry, you'll also get a certificate. Okay, so let's just um, move on to um, the first slide in my presentation. Uh, this, this slide comes from, uh, comes from some research that I did a few years back now. Um, I was working for a, a school that was 100% online. We had about 70 different teachers and you know about seven or 800 students and delivered about 2000 lessons to them each month. And um, one of the things that that we found was very important was understanding why some teachers were more successful than the others. We had some lots of different teachers with different backgrounds and they were coming, many of them were coming to teach online for the first time because this was back in 2014, 2015. And um, we wanted to sort of understand what, what made a successful online teacher. And uh, I limited it down to sort of these three, six areas which, which were necessary um, to help uh, uh, teachers transfer the skills that they had into the classroom, into the, to the skills that they needed to be successful online. If you want to get a copy of this presentation, uh, sorry, this infographic here, it's, it's interactive. Um, as you can see, you can just click on it on the buttons to get more information about each of these background things. 
and uh, you can you can scan the QR code to get a copy of that if you'd like. I'll also I'll just pop a copy of it into the chat for you if you want to see it, although it's going to disappear pretty quickly. There's a link there to the chat if you want to see that. Let's get back to my presentation. Okay. So this were the, these were the six main areas. They were kind of environmental, and that was about the teaching environment that you're working in. And that's by that I mean this space around you when you're working at home. There's the kind of technical, which is getting to, to know the platform. The interpersonal, which is your ability to build you know, a connection with your students using this kind of platform. Uh, there was pedagogical issues, you know, uh, understanding what the differences were and how you had to, sh what, what things you had to change in order to be successful online. Behavioural issues, which was, you know, managing the class, how to manage the class in in this kind of environment as opposed to the the, the physical environment. And this issue of, of motivation, you know, motivation is very different when you're when you're studying online to when you're going to a classroom and your motivation is impacted in different ways. So if you want to find out more about those, do have a look at this, this infographic and click on the buttons later on. For the moment, I won't go into too much depth about that. What I'll just say is that, you know, when we did our research into what really makes a successful teacher online and in the remote classroom, we discovered that one of these things was predominantly stronger than all the other five. Um, if you want to try and guess which one it is, you can type it into the chat now. I'll give you a couple of minutes to type into the chat, which do you think was the, the, the fundamental um, factor that made teachers more successful while they were teaching in the remote classroom? I'll give you a couple of minutes to type that in. Okay, and I'll give you the answer now. And the answer is, it was actually the interpersonal one. You know, it was the interpersonal aspects that really defined teachers who were the, the most successful. And, and that was their ability to use the webcam and their ability to sort of project their character and make a connection with their students using the webcam. So the interpersonal aspect we discovered was very, very important. And that's really what, you know, what, what defined a successful teacher when within our environment. Um, we, we worked in a very commercial environment in the school. So actually students were able to go and choose their own teacher each time they went for a class. They were doing mainly one-to-one -one classes. And so, you know, being able to project your, your personality and build that connection with students was very important because those were the those were the teachers who were being more successful and they were getting more classes and more students were booking them so you know that that was how we managed to define which of these characteristics was the most helped students uh, teachers be the most successful so let's move on to you know how 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 do they do that and and, and how were they achieving that and these are the things that we found really helped. I mean, one of the first things, you know, students see when they look at the screen is you on your webcam. And um, if you look like this and you're, and you're working like this, then probably you're not going to be building those great interpersonal communications. Um, so really what you want to move from is something like this, the teacher who's leaning over the camera, looking down on the students, isn't making any eye contact. You want to shift to something that's a bit more like teacher number two here. Um, I don't say this guy's perfect. He could certainly be smiling a lot more, um, but I'm not very good at smiling for the camera. Um, but you know, somebody who's, in this case, who's standing up, who's trying to make eye contact, who's showing more of the body, um, you know, is dressed appropriately as well. You'll be surprised how many people, just because they're either teaching or learning online, don't think it's necessary to uh, to put some 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 proper clothes on. And we had to even had put sort of some students turning up to class in just their vests. So you know, dress properly, uh, and you know, look like you're there to do business and to, to be a teacher. 
So let's let's have a look at how we we get that. You know, I think one of the most important things, you know, is using the webcam and using your webcam, you know, to use your webcam properly, you need to get the camera at eye level, you know, so that that might be um, involved using a riser, um, using a, or using a, um, some boxes to put your laptop on or something like that. I actually have a riser on my desk that lifts the lifts the um, computer up. So I, I teach standing up. So and for me, this is great because I can move about a bit more. It's also quite important to try and get the, par the, the screen parallel with your body, because if you're using a laptop and the screen is tilted back, it tends to distort the shape of your of your body because the the, the the point of um, focus moves through your body. Um, so this is this is the thing you should try to avoid if you're using if you're working with an app, a laptop. So there's like the the screen is pointing back. It's not parallel to the body. And so what you'll get is some distortion and students will get a very nice view of your ceiling, uh, a really large size head and then a smaller body underneath it. And of course, because it's only showing the top of your head and the top part of your body, you're not able to use your body language or your hands very much as I'm doing here you know, and now. And this, these kind of gestures and using your hands are a very important part of communication. So if you are working on a laptop, try just putting, you can get a riser, which looks like the blue thing you can see underneath here, or you can get some boxes so that the laptop's at an angle, you can push the screen back further then, and you keep it parallel to your body. And as you can see, the, the kind of range of focus then has, uh, picks up much more of you in, in, its, in, in this and makes that visible. And also because you're parallel to it, you won't find so much distortion. So that's one of the first things. It lifts your 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 uh, your um, laptop up to your eye level, so you've got your your camera on eye level, and it stops that distortion. So you're going to look at a, a, a little. You're going to look, look a little less like this guy here, and hopefully a bit more like this guy, but when he's smiling. Okay. So let's let's move on. One of the next things about eye contact is, you know, actually thinking about where you're looking when you're doing your presentation. You know, if you're if you're looking at your screen rather than your camera, then you're not really making eye contact. And eye contact is a very important part of communication. You know, we 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 we, we um, take in so much of what we understand by how people are feeling, what they're thinking, whether they're believing us or not, whether they're lying to us or not, through the eyes, you know, the eyes, they say, are the window to the soul. So let's sort of try and make uh, some communicate, uh, some communication and some eye contact. You know, if you're doing a presentation of some kind or doing a lesson, try to avoid reading as much as you can if you're reading a script or something. It really sort of uh, hurts with the eye contact. And one of the easiest ways to improve it is if you can see my image here, when you're doing a presentation, you have what I call the monitor here, which is where you can see yourself. You know, on Zoom, you can't do this on every platform, but on Zoom, for example, you can drag this around. So if you drag it up to the top of the screen, as, as you can see my image here and it's underneath your webcam then while you watch yourself and you're watching your body language it makes you much more likely to make eye contact with the camera because you know your your eye naturally goes to where you are on the screen so that, that you can see yourself so that will help with your your eye contact if you're if you're struggling with that so um that's a that's another quick tip Another thing, good thing to do is actually think about the space and distance from the camera. You know, the closer you are to the camera, the more imposing you are. So if you can see me, I'm right up close now. Um, even though I'm sort of making eye contact, that's still a little bit imposing. You know, you can see that my head's distorted. So, you know, try to move back. I mean, I actually use a Bluetooth headset so that I don't have any wires and that makes it easier for me to move around, you know, and I can get that that bit further back from the camera and I can stand up so that you can see much more of me and uh, you can I can use my body language use my hands and my gestures you know I know like like most teachers I, I always used to use a lot of gestures in the classroom and when I wanted to point to the past okay that was yesterday so use past tense or or you know doing a pronunciation work on your fingers and, and dividing up syllables you know just by having that space makes it easier to do that 
You can also start playing with the distance as well. You know, again, this is something that we do in the physical classroom. You know, if you think about uh, teaching in the physical classroom, when you do a listening or when you do a re reading activity or when you're giving uh, um, spoken instructions about a, a task, you change your position within the classroom and you'll move around. And you can do the same here. So you can use proximity and you can move in towards students and say, hey, I'm listening to you kind of thing. Or you can move out and say, okay, speak among yourselves and actually, you know, get out of the frame so that they don't feel that you're watching and listening right over their shoulder. So it gives them a little bit of space. Okay, so think about standing up, moving around, playing with the distance from the camera. You know, think more like an actor and how an actor works with the camera. You know, as well, you know, think about how you use your hands, facial expression, you know, are you smiling? You know, I, I, I can remember seeing a, a video of one teacher um, uh, who was teaching online and he was sit sitting like this at his desk the whole th way through the lesson you know and it, it looked as though he was so bored you know remember that you, your students can see you and if you're enthusiastic about your lesson and you're projecting that enthusiasm then they're more likely to to be enthusiastic about it too you know remember that you're a model for good communication through this webcam you know, you have to model what they should be doing themselves when they're communicating it with it. And that's quite an important skill, you know. Um, increasingly, you know, in the workforce, stu um, people, once they leave school, they're going to be working in, in these kind of remote environments and using these, kind of, these kinds of tools. And we have to become very good at using them. So, you know, teach that kind of communication, teach them how to use the webcam well. Another important aspect is, is sound, of course. You know, your voice when you're in the classroom, you know, is one of the most important tools that you have. You use it very differently. You know, if, you're, if you've got a big classroom and large class, you're likely to project it right to the back of the room. You know, when you come in to talk to students, when they're working in smaller groups, you'll drop the tone of your voice. You know, and I think having a headset and using a, a headset to help you do that, such as this one, I've got a Bluetooth one in here that has microphones, can help you control the volume of your voice. You know, I know, you know, I've been to a few conferences, online conferences, where teachers or presenters haven't been using a microphone, they've just been using the one built into their, into their laptop. And most of them are, are using what I, I used to call my outdoor voice or my, my father's outdoor voice. You know, they're bellowing at the, at the computer to make sure that you can hear them properly and really projecting too loud. And that it becomes very different, difficult to listen to. You know, if you're shouting to, to your computer to be heard, you know, somebody's got you shouting into their ears at the other end. And that's not a pleasant experience. So, you know, understand how to use the volume, how to control the volume, you know and and how to use it in a in a productive way remember you know one of the big benefits of this kind of classroom is that you know unlike in the physical classroom you can actually mute your students so you don't need to shout over the noise if they're making too much noise so just think about how you use your voice how you use the dynamics of it you can be quieter or you can be louder and if your students are using headphones to listen to you that will be that will be um, much easier for them to listen to as well. Okay, um, I'm going to look at some practical activities that can that can help build, you know, the way you use the webcam and and how you build, you know, your interpersonal skills with students. But just before that, I'd like to I'd like to do a little questionnaire give you a little questionnaire to fill in and i'd like to find out you know how do your students feel about um using the webcam do you have problems getting them to use it are they happy to use it if you get a mobile phone and scan the qr code that you can see here you'll see a little questionnaire or you can go to menti.com and then enter this code and then sort of type in your response if you type in your response there rather than into the chat everybody will be able to see it and there you know there won't be that kind of stream so I'll give you a couple of minutes just to scan the qr code or go to menti.com and type in a quick response to that i'll give you a couple of minutes to do that okay
Okay, I'm back. Let's see what we've got and if anyone's managed to use that. Okay, yeah. So now you should be able to see the responses from the different people that we've got here. 63 so far. They hate it. Yeah, that's quite common. Um, nervous, not comfortable, not very comfortable. My students aren't required to turn it on, so most of them have turned off during classes. Some don't like it. Yeah, predominantly the response from students is that they don't like having their camera on and they don't like showing it. And again, this is, this is why it's so important for us to, to use the camera wisely and to use it to model good communication. So, you know, I think we have to start teaching our students how to use it, because if you can't see your students and you're, they can't see you properly, then you can't build those interpersonal skills with them. And that's that that makes, you know, being successful in this kind of environment very difficult. You know. There's lots of other. Well, there are some some students who like it, yeah. Okay, so here are a few activities that you can do using your camera and, and get students to do. And these are the sort of things that encourage them to use the camera and, in, and use it in a way to communicate. Uh, one of the first things is, is, you know, get them to do show and tell. They're at home, get them to find something as a warmer that they can show to everyone else and tell them about it. I've got my little example here. I've, I'm showing it to you now. So I'll come up close and here you can see it. There it is. This is my little, uh, it's a little glass nail. And uh, this is one of the, one of the most valuable objects that I have, well, it's valuable to me anyway. It sits on my desk every day. And, and it's uh, something that's very important to me because it was the first ever Father's Day gift that I got from my oldest daughter. And I can remember her you know, buy, buying this with her own money and wrapping it up and, and giving it to me on Father's Day. So that's something that's very important to me. You see, it's made of glass, it's green, very shiny and I keep it on my desk here every day. So it keeps me company. So, you know, getting students to just to share something or sharing something yourself, you know, with your students and get them to use the, the webcam in that way, you know, in, encourages them to sort of um, turn it on and see that there is a purpose to using it and see that they're uh, using it well. There's a, another game which I like to, to play, and again, you can play this as a warmer to revise vocabulary, and it's, it's a, a game called The Magic Object, and I'll show you it now. Here, you can see that in my hands, I have a magic object. So, you know, what I want you to do is try to guess what the object is. You know, type it into the chat, what you think's in my hand, what do you think is here? Actually, I shouldn't have told you it was a magic object, I should just have told you I have something in my hands. Okay, what do you think is in my hands? Okay, so you get students to try and guess what it is. Oh, some nice guesses. And so we've got some nice vocabulary coming out already. Okay, I'll show you it, okay? Here it is. It's a magic object. It's invisible. And so it can change into anything. The object can change into anything. I want you to tell me what it is now. What is it? Great, uh, yeah, matches, great. What is it now? Great, 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 good. Okay, once you've demonstrated it a few times to your students, hand it to one of them and get them to do, make it into something else. So, and when you hand it to them, hand it through the camera. Okay, so one of you can take it. Okay, I'll pass it to you. Okay, don't drop it. Take it and make it into something else. And you can get students to actually pass it round the class through their camera and uh, make it into different objects. And then at the end, of course, you can revise all the different objects. You know, what were the 
what objects can you remember? What did this person make it into? What did that person make it into? Okay, and they're, they're using the camera to do this. They're making, you're making it really nice and physical and giving them a connection by passing it to them. And, uh, you know, it's a game that they can enjoy and can reduce the stress or, or, or um, discomfort of having the camera on. So give that one a try if you, especially with younger students, this can be very nice. Uh, something that's more serious, I guess, is, is mirroring you know when we when we communicate with people and we talk to people in the physical space we naturally mirror them if we're feeling sympathetic and empathetic for with them and it's something that you can get your students to try too so you demonstrate a, a pose for example you know and you get your students to mirror okay so give them a, you can give them a speaking activity to do while they do this as well so get them to mirror each other's postures so try and mirror me now okay So mirroring is something that we naturally do when we empathize with someone or with or when we like them. So it's something we naturally do in conversation. So again, use this as a way of, of raising students awareness about they about how they communicate with each other and how they build empathy and and actually get them turning on their, their webcam to do it and show them that the, the, the it has a purpose, you know, and that's an important part of communication. You know, we'll Another thing that you can do with younger students is to, to encourage them, or, or maybe with older students as well, is have a dress up day. It doesn't have to be fancy dress with older students. It, it could be actually wear something smart today, wear something that you like, wear something you're, you're proud of. And of course, you know, this is a great excuse to turn the camera on. And because we're all wearing costumes, you know, it reduces some of the stress. You have to be prepared to do it yourself, of course. So I, I have my, my, my silly hat that I can wear if I want to encourage other people to do this. And, uh, and that kind of cuts some of the stress out as well. You know, you, you could actually sort of get them sort of wearing uh, um, sunglasses, dark glasses and hats if they're feeling self-conscious about being the being on the camera. You know, try to make it fun. Try to make, you know, looking at each other part of an activity and try and make it fun. There's also kind of attitude, you know, get, make students aware that, you know, what they can see, what you're showing on the camera shows different attitudes and try and guess the different attitudes. For example, you know, this guy here, what attitude is he projecting? Or this one here? Or how about this guy here? Or this one? And, and actually get them to mime attitudes and try and copy each other. So suggest an attitude and get them all to take the posture. OK, so everybody look bored. Okay, everybody look excited, you know, everybody look like you're thinking, you know, and try, try to work with that happy, sad ones, you know, and things like that. So there's lots of things that you can do to sort of make students aware of, you know, their body posture, how they use their body and how it conveys different attitudes. And it's important, you know, especially again, coming back to the real life of work that, you know, the attitude you project is appropriate for your workplace and the things that you're doing. So work with that one. Um, another one, again, for, for Shire students is puppets. I actually have a puppet around here. You can get them, if they're, they're, they're shy about being seen on the camera, get them to use a puppet. They can actually make a puppet on their finger if they paint, they just make a kind of little face on their finger or, or with, their, with their hand like this, or they, they can have some kind of puppet and they can show the puppet instead of showing themselves. You know, a bit it's better for you, perhaps with younger learners where they might be more, more shy and uh, they can sort of use, you can use them or they can use them to sort of build role plays or, or to do sort of speaking activities where they feel exposed. But, but that can sort of make, um, you know, speaking activities a bit more fun. You can even sort of get them to design different characters for different speaking parts. Somebody here has a puppet story as well. That's great, you know. But it's a, another good way of, of uh, getting students to turn the camera on. Um, one of the other things that I think, or one of the last things I'll show you that's to do with sort of building interpersonal communications is, is kind of actually being more aware of how students are feeling, you know, and, and that's a, 
a process called empathy mapping can really help with that. And uh, thinking this comes from sort of product development and helping to understand how customers feel. But it's a very useful activity because, you know, understanding our students and the things that they're going through and trying to sort of build some level of empathy, I think, with them is very important, you know. And there are a few questions here which it can help you to to sort of focus on on what your students are feeling or going through. You can also build a kind of student persona and build this kind of empathy map like we have here on the on the left and think about, you know, who our, who our students are, you know, what things do they need to do, you know, what other things are going on in their lives, you know, why are they studying English and, you know, what, what are the things that influence their studying online, you know, actually thinking it through some of these things and the kind of things that are stressing our students can help us get a kind of better understanding of what's going on with them and sort of can, can sort of help us link into their motivation as well. You know, I think it's very important, you know, to, to sort of understand, you know, what's happening with them. It's a very difficult time for everyone. You know, a lot of students are stuck at home when they want to go out. Um, a, a lot of students, maybe some students are, have, have family members who are sick or who have even died. And, you know, we need to be cognizant of that, I think, and start to sort of think around, you know, the obstacles that our students face and, and, uh, and building, a, and that's part of building a better relationship with them. So that's about it for input. I'll share a link with, to the presentation with you in the mo in a moment. But you know, so now if you if you want questions, I'll, I'll try and sort of deal with any of the the questions that have come in. We've had some really interesting questions come in. That was such a fascinating session. So thank Great. you so much for for sharing with us. Thank so the you. first question came in from from Binny Doshi. Um, Binny is saying, how do we manage eye contact when we've got thirty learners in the Zoom class? Well, even though you have 30 learners in the Zoom class, you, if you're looking at the camera, your eye contact comes through to all of them. So if I'm looking at the camera now, and even though there are 400 of you, I'm making contact with all 400 of you. You know, the thing is to look at the camera and not to look at the screen. You know, if you're looking, now I'm sort of looking at, I'm trying to sort of make eye contact with Emma here, and I'm looking at the screen, and I'm not actually making eye contact with anyone. But, you know, if I look back at the camera, there is, there's the eye contact again. You know, so the, the number of students isn't a challenge, honest. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got another question in from um, Chandrakala Manda Party, and I do apologize for my, my terrible pronunciation. Um, how do we stop students from leaving class when you're asking questions? Um, it's a difficult one because you know if if they're logged into the class you never know whether they're there or not but which is one of the advantages of getting them to sort of put their camera on because you can actually see whether they're getting up to leave or not you know if you if you switch it to the communication mode you can have all of the boxes lined up and you can see who's there and who's got up to go and get a sandwich or something like that so you know th that's another way where you know encouraging students to use the camera can really benefit you and can make make your class easier to manage in that way. And that leads on really nicely to um, a question we've had in from Sarah Anjum, who's saying um, a lot of Harris students are really reluctant to turn their cameras on. Have you got any strategies for encouraging them to do that? I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the activities that we've been looking at, if you're using the camera yourself and you're using the camera for these activities, then they're more likely to sort of want to turn it on to, because they need to turn it on to become part of the activity. They see that there's a use for it. Teach good communication skills using this space and sort of emphasize to them how important it is to communicate well in in this kind of environment, you know, increasingly is becoming a feature of, of, of people's work, you know, okay, eventually the virus is going to go away, but you know, our lives have changed dramatically because of it. And you know, your ability to communicate in this environment is going to become a valuable work skill. So, you know, try and convince them of that and, and convince them how important it is to sort of use it and to learn how to use it well, you know setting up their environment appropriately really helps, you know, and you modeling good use of it really helps as well. Brilliant, thanks Nick. And um, we have a question in from Isabella Tam. Um, Isabella is asking, what things can we do to encourage young learners to interact with each other online? So less of a teacher-led session. Um, Isabella is saying she's not very comfortable putting the younger students in breakout rooms because it doesn't really work. She can't monitor all of them all at once. 
That is difficult, but, you know, in the end, breakout rooms are the solution to that problem, you know, and I think, you know, getting students into groups, into breakout rooms to work together, you know, take, it takes some time to make that work, you know, don't expect it to work the first time. One thing that you can do is actually within your group, if, say, for example, you're putting four students in a group, into a group in a breakout room together, make one of them responsible for sort of monitoring the rest of the group, you know, give them a task to do and say hey you, you you're the one you make sure everybody does the job make sure people are doing this or you can get them to sort of be the person who looks out for errors or who looks out for good points or something like that or or is the manager of the group but give one person responsibility and then get them that person to feed back to you from the group at the end so get your students to be your monitors and get them to monitor each other you know so they work as a team like that and that can can make out the breakout rooms a bit more successful but it is a challenge it won't happen immediately you know you have to train them to use things like that that's a really really useful strategy thank you um so we've also got um got the questions are coming in thick and fast now um, we have a question from Nazreen. Nazreen is saying lots of schools are actually encouraging teachers not to use webcams for various reasons. Some of the people in, um, in the chat have actually been posting saying that the students are taking screenshots and creating memes of their teachers, so they're really reluctant to turn the camera on. Um, have you got any kind of advice um, on how to manage engaging students if you can't have your webcam on? Um. What I'd say is, you know, the problem is being created by a lack of learner training, you know, and I think you need to train, you know, before students go into this kind of environment, they ought to be trained. And within their learner training, there should also be some kind of code of practice. You know, I wonder how many of you are working in schools, working in remote classrooms where your students or you don't have any kind of code of practice. And it's important to establish a code of practice so that students know what is expected of them and what is unacceptable you know and that they agree to that and maybe you know their parents sign up to that as well if you've got younger learners so you know they should understand that it's not acceptable to take screenshots during class you know and they should understand how to report that if something uh, unsuitable is happening in their classroom if they're being harassed or by another student or you know intimidated or they know some student who's doing something wrong there should be a reporting process and they should know what what you know the, the the consequences of doing something like this are you know the the main problem is that students and, and teachers are just being thrown into this these remote classes together without any real training and without knowing you know what is and what isn't acceptable and you know that's i think that's where it comes back to the school to establish that procedure and make sure that students are trained they do have a code of practice and they, they do know that there are rules because there are rules in the physical school and there have to be rules in the remote school too so you know that that's my best advice Advice really is you know get your school on board and train around it you know because you shouldn't have to work in that kind of environment okay um and there's an interesting question coming from emma parry um who's asking do you think that online learning should you should expect the same results for offline learning um I, I I think the results are always going to be a bit different. I wouldn't say one is better or one is worse, or you should expect more from one or less from another. But you know what you achieve is going to be different. You know it's different to learn to communicate in this environment from a, learning to communicate in a physical environment. You know it requires different skills, and so students are going to learn different things. You know they work in a different way. Motivation impacts them in a different way. You know, but we, you know, we have to learn to understand the differences and make sure that, you know, we achieve the best that we can through whichever medium. But that doesn't mean that one is better or one is worse, but I think they're just very different. You know? Okay, we've just had a question come in from um, Angelina Carpeo Reyes, who's asking if you have any suggestions or activities to help build up webcam confidence to begin lots and lots of kind of themes coming through with um, students not feeling comfortable, not being confident, how can we engage them? Um, I think that, that kind of encapsulates a lot of those. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the answer to that is using as many kind of 
visually based activities that you can, you know, for example, these show and tell warmers, you can start off with just sort of doing warmers. So like, we're just gonna have the camera on for five minutes. I'm gonna show you something and talk to talk about it. You're gonna show me something and talk about it. You know, using MIME, being a good model for communication with the webcam, you know, all of those kinds of things can help students become more confident. But, you know, maybe, you know, start off by just having a, a visual warmer, you know, and taking a bit of stress off them. You know, what, one thing that, that, that we, we forget, you know, in the remote classroom is that in the physical classroom, one of the reasons students like to come to class isn't for the lessons, sorry to, to make you aware of that, but it's actually to see each other and to have a chat and to catch up with their friends and things like that. You know, so try and make some time for that where, they, where you can put them in a breakout room together, even if it's only for four minutes, put five minutes, put them in breakout rooms together just to say hello to each other and have a chat and a gossip and things like that. And, you know, they can sort of get more familiar with using the webcam and seeing each other on the webcam like that, so that you're not sort of overseeing them during that process, you know, just give them some sociable time and some games and, you know, something to do together. You know, it doesn't, you know, not everything about going to, to school or going to class is about learning. A lot of it's about socialising and, you know, having the opportunity to do that will really help. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think we've only got time for a couple more questions because we are getting up to okay. the quarter to the hour. Um, we've just had one come in from um, Selma Goxon, who's uh, she's an art teacher. Um, Selma is saying um, it can be difficult to keep students interested when they're doing a project which might last for a number of weeks. Have you got any um, any practical tips for kind of managing that where you've got something that's, that's going over you know a prolonged period of time? Yeah, project work is, is actually really useful for doing online. And I think, you know, it's a great question. You know, but if your project, you know, if you've set up your teams well for your project, it should work quite well. You know, doing projects where you just say, hey, this is a project, you know, go away and do it isn't going to work so well. But if you put students into project teams, give them research tasks to do together, give them an online space that they can use together like this one, not necessarily Zoom, but there are lots of free ones where they can sort of meet up together and work on their projects together in their own time, you know, so get them meeting up together and, and make sure when you when you create teams to do project work that students decide on different roles that they will get, you know, try and think about the dynamics in your team, who's going to be the team leader, you know, what's the name of the team? You know, who's going to be the chief researcher? Who's going to be the, the person who checks that everything's right? You know, different personalities have different strengths. So you want, ideally, you want the team for your project work that has a, a range of different personalities. If, if you're interested in finding out more about sort of teams and the project, uh, Google, um, I think it's Bono's Six Hats. There are some, apparently six different hats that you can wear to sort of analyze a project or a problem. Think about how you can use that and get students using that within your class, because that can be really useful to get to make projects work well. But getting students to doing them together, I can think can really help them, them sort of keep the motivation up. Brilliant. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. I can see we've had so many brilliant questions come through the chat that we just haven't had a chance to get to. Um, so I do apologise if we didn't get around to answering yours. Nick, if it's OK, um, I might drop some of them over to you and then we'll answer sure. them in the, in the YouTube comments um, when we post the video on our playlist. So I hope you've enjoyed the session. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you again so much for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.